Hello everybody. All right, so I've wanted to make a video about this for a little while, and luckily, because of earning stuff, maybe to distract from the actors and writers strike, uh, famous yachtsman Bob Iger came out and did a little interview. He wanted to talk about movies and the plans for Disney going forward. And he had a couple of things they said. The, the big one that stood out is that basically they're going to scale back production on their Marvel and Star Wars stuff. And I thought that's interesting because I don't quite see, I don't understand that. Obviously, I'm not saying that like, I don't think there's changes they need to make or ways they can improve, but scaling back production, I found kind of confusing. And I wanted to talk about this it, because the article that I read it on, I think it was like on Complex or something. It wasn't the original article, but this article that gave me this information when I looked this up had a little bit of editorializing, let's say, in the article. And one of the things that this person said was they were saying like, well, you know, there's all these problems with like, if you want to watch Doctor Strange, you have to watch WandaVision. And there's it's a mix of like superhero fatigue and the audience is not going back to movie theaters, all that stuff. And that got my brain going, oh, superhero movie fatigue. That's right. I said in the beginning of the year that that's not a thing. And now we have had five big superhero movies from three different studios so we have some data we have some data about disney and marvel and star wars and all that in general well we're really not star wars because star wars hasn't released a movie this year but i wanted to just look at that and see bob what is going on why is this such a problem and why is your solution feel kind of strange to me um what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna bring up because i made a little spreadsheet and i have it on my little on my kindle uh, fire so I want to just go over because okay so the top 17 highest grossing movies this year so far not counting movies that were only released overseas like in China and stuff because if you do the worldwide releases you do get a fair amount of movies or it has only international no domestic numbers just so it's like that doesn't count in this ranking because I don't know what that movie is but okay top 17 movies I'm gonna list them in order there's at least three movies on this list that have not ended their theatrical run uh, you have Elemental, Indiana Jones, and Mission Impossible. So those guys are lower on the list than I, I would expect some of them. But I think Elemental and Indiana Jones, just based on the gaps between where they are and where you have to get to get to like one spot up, I think will probably stay where they are. Now, keep in mind, I'm recording this video on July 17th of 2023 so there's plenty of movies left to come out. Here's the top 17. I'm starting 17 go up. I'm going to talk about box office. I'm going to talk about their budgets, Rotten Tomatoes score, and like kind of bringing all those things together. Um, but but real quick, just in order, Shazam Fury of the Gods, 17, 16, Evil Dead Rise, Scream 6, Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1. Again, I have a feeling that will end up higher on the list at the end. The Flash, Creed 3, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, Elemental, Transformers Rise of the Beast, John Wick Chapter 4, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, and then the top five. The Little Mermaid, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, Fast X, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, and the Super Mario Brothers movie. Those are the 17, as of today, highest grossing, let's say, released domestic in, in, the, in the United States uh, movies. Like I said, I have a feeling, you know, Aquaman will probably be on this list at the end of the year. Marvels will probably be on this list at the end of the year. I wouldn't be surprised if, like, Oppenheimer or Barbie make it on this list. Blue Beetle, Ninja Turtles, if it's a really big hit. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's others. Wonka, the greatest movie ever made, could be on this list. But for now, these are the 17. I stopped at 17 because it's Shazam Fury of the Gods, uh, which is the last superhero movie of the five on this list. And this is why I think it's so weird that Bob Iger comes out and says, listen, we've got to scale back production on these things. Bob, you got the number two movie on this list. And it's ve it was very well reviewed, right? When it and it's sandwiched between Super Mario and Fast X which both are rocking a strong 58 and 57 on Rotten Tomatoes. So right in between them, they have Guardians 3 with an 82 on Rotten Tomatoes. Great. It had a very strong box office in that it opened strong and it kept going strong because people really like that movie. Had a budget of $250 million, which is expensive, but you can see the money on screen. It had humongous stars, really, really impressive special effects, and lots of prosthetics. Apparently it broke the record for prosthetics in a movie. So if you take the budget as being $250 million, and the worldwide 
box office. And obviously there's that like kind of like you want budget, you double the budget for marketing and stuff like that. And also these are studios reporting budgets. A lot of this is estimated. So who knows how much money this movie actually costs to make. But $250 million, especially looking at some of these other movies on the list, that sounds reasonable. Um, like that's that's probably what I'd guess for this movie as well. It made $842 million worldwide, which means it made about $600 million in profit. Pretty good profit. <laughs> like I understand, like I said, the marketing thing, but still hundreds of millions of dollars of profit for this movie. And that's not counting. And I know we joke about, you know, <laughs> a certain Dwayne the Rock, the Tooth Fairy, the Game Plan Johnson talking about like, oh, we, we haven't gotten DVD sales in and toys and stuff. But like, I'm assuming the DVD sales for this were quite good. Uh, I don't know if DVDs are actually out yet, but I know that there's digital out. I'm assuming a lot of people bought it. I know I know at least one person, and it's a small circle, that, but who didn't see it in the theaters, but who bought it the weekend it came out on DVD. So, or Blu-ray, or not Blu-ray. They bought it on the computer. So it's making money there. There's lots of toys, and they seem to be doing somewhat well. I think this is a marketable toy movie with Groot and Rocket Raccoon, you know, other animals. There's plenty of good figures like or there's a lot of merchandising money in this movie. So, Bob, you're doing great. Like, this is a good year for Disney. And I'll say like, so you don't have three or four. You have five and six. Five Little Mermaid. Now, The Little Mermaid, what an expensive movie. That also cost $250 million. And that I can understand how it could be that expensive but like Guardians, you're bringing in some of the biggest stars on earth, like Chris Pratt, Vin Diesel, Bradley Cooper, you know, Zoe Saldana. Those, those are all right there. Big, big stars, like movie stars. And not to say that Halle Bailey, I think is her name, is not like potentially a star, but she's not a household name. Melissa McCarthy, is she like the biggest star in that movie? Like, so A, you're not getting the money in stars. B, the effects are, they're, they're good, but it's also like... Not as good as animations. It's going to be hard to stand up to it, I, you know. But that movie made about $547 million, made a big chunk uh, domestic, which is not surprising. Apparently, the overseas for that just didn't didn't materialize for many reasons. Um, but regardless of what those are, uh, Little Mermaid still, you know, assuming that you doubled the budget, I'm assuming that made a profit. That made some profit. And you're going to sell a lot of stuff to kids and toys. And also, because you're Disney, a lot of the stuff's going into the parks. And Bob, you know this. You know these numbers. Um, but then, so you say things like, oh, we need to scale back on these Marvel things. It's like, well, I mean, I would believe that last year, maybe. But you've a humongous hit this year. And then you have Little Mermaid, which, yeah, whatever. Uh, Quantumania made... $476 million. Again, this is maybe one of the lower Rotten Tomato scores. In fact, it is the lowest Rotten Tomato score on this list at 46. I think it's earned it. And it has a budget of $200 million. Uh, but still, that probably made a profit. Now, if you want to talk about something specifically... Oh, look, Mortimer's in the back of the whole thing. Great. Hi, sweetie. If you want to look at something specifically that you can improve on, because obviously the CGI, people didn't like parts of it, and you're working your CGI artist to death, 100% agree. I, I don't think any problems were like their fault or like laziness. It was all just management. And, you know, a lot of people were working on the same projects at the same times. But also, like talking about merchandising and stuff, when that movie came out, regardless of how I thought about it, I would have bought a Kang action figure, like a Kang action figure, not the He Who Remains action figure from Loki. But like I would have went to the store and bought a Kang. I probably would have went to the store and bought a MODOK if they had it just because it's MODOK and I love MODOK even though that's probably not my favorite interpretation of MODOK. I also would have bought that book that you advertised as like being written by Scott Lang. I thought that was fantastic as like an idea for how to have a movie tie-in thing and then the book is still isn't even out. So like if part of what you're saying we have to tighten up on this timetable is syncing all that up 100% agree. It's crazy that I still can't buy a Daredevil action figure from She-Hulk or a you know, Jen from She-Hulk action figure from She-Hulk or a Madison action figure or a, you know, Leapfrog or any of those characters from She-Hulk. There's one She-Hulk action figure. And I own it. And I, I just don't understand with some of the merchandising for this, what the decisions were. But like Disney, you make a lot of money on merchandising. I'm sure you know that. Anyway, so you had, you had Quantumania, not a big, but like you can see here, right? We can look at these numbers and say, Superhero movie fatigue is not the problem. When there's a good movie with a positive, let's say, over 80 Rotten Tomatoes score, and one that I think deserved a higher Rotten Tomatoes score, but whatever, people come out and watch it. 80, 
2% translated to about 840 million worldwide. Whereas a 46% for Quantumania translated to about 476,000 per million worldwide, excuse me. So like, it's not a one-to-one and this isn't gonna be tracked for every single movie here, but like good Rotten Tomato score makes money. Does not maybe make as much money as Guardians 1 did, but makes, or, well, I don't think, I think it made as much money as Guardians 1. I don't think it made as much money as Guardians 2, but it still made almost the same amount of money. Yeah, it's, this is success. I, this is the part of this that kind of baffles me. Like, listen, if you wanted, if Bob Iger came out, did an interview and said, it's Lucasfilm stuff is what we need to work on. We made an Indiana Jones movie that is made so far about 300 million worldwide. It'll probably end up higher than that, but I don't see it being higher than like 350, especially now. I I can't imagine the tail on that is very strong, but it costs $300 million to make. You got to figure that out. Like that, that's, that's not good. But like besides Super Mario Brothers this year, you can't do better. Now you also have on this list. So those are superhero movies. You got uh, Guardians, Ant-Man. Those are the two Marvel ones. You have two DC movies, which I could teach a class on these movies like these these are these get their own chapter in the history of superhero movie book it's Shazam Fury of the Gods ended with 133 million worldwide had a 49% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 125 million dollar budget so you factor in marketing I'm, I'm assuming they lost some money however this was the first movie that came out post the gun announcement we all kind of expected that it wouldn't do super well there reviews weren't great and practically immediately it gets pulled from theaters and ends up on HBO Max or direct download or whatever we're calling it, but like that movie got no chance. And maybe, you know, HBO Max, Warner Discovery, whatever we're calling it, like they looked at the numbers and were like, this isn't going to make any more money. But like a movie with really bad reviews for these, like I'd say under 50% for one of these big superhero movies is pretty rough. Like Quantumania, I think with 46 makes it the lowest review, like Rotten Tomato score Marvel movie. So being under 50, yeah, it didn't make a lot of money. And then you got Flash, 64% uh, percent of Rotten Tomatoes, made $263 million. Reported budget of 220 although I think we'll find out. I, I mean, I don't know. There were reshoots on reshoots on reshoots, so who knows? And there were definitely a lot of problems with that movie, and there's a million reasons why someone wouldn't go see it if it has to do with the actors, their problems, the lack of connection to this future DC stuff the connection to past DC stuff that people don't really like, the fact that it's a Flashpoint movie, the fact that this was maybe the first big, one of the first big movies to come out during the writer's strike. So the promotion was very like non-existent. Obviously they couldn't promote it that much anyway because their star, one of their stars was in London filming the movie and the other one is like in the back. They're not letting him promote. But also like you couldn't go on Seth Meyers, you couldn't go on, you know, talk shows jimmy fallon and promote your movie because they canceled the whole thing because the writer's strike so i do think that has affected movies in a big way uh bigger than that we are giving them credit for because i think that helps big time to create buzz and that just doesn't exist like obviously it's going to be a lot different now with the writers and the actors striking but still i think that is a factor i don't know how much percentage wise it you know adds up to this movie not doing incredibly well but like that's what happened like so again we have two movies the flash and Shazam fury of the gods poorly reviewed very expensive they're coming out on the heels of this reboot the reboot is in front of them it is it is there so they're just uh, they're almost there but they're not quite there yet so like people don't want to invest in this universe which i understand also the ending's weird they have movies like elemental one of the higher budgets on this list 200 million Indiana Jones and Dial of Destiny, 300 million. Both of those are 9 and 10 with about 300 million uh, dollar worldwide gross. If the camera's shaking, it's because Mortimer is nuzzling against the tripod, which he's not supposed to do, sweetie. Mortimer, just relax. Do nothing right now. Lay down, you're a cat. So The Flash and Shazam Fury of the Gods, both poorly reviewed and in a super weird spot with their respective universes star some had stars that couldn't promote the movie and some had stars that people were actively boycotting which makes sense um based on everything that you know like i totally get that so then yeah of course those movies didn't do well like i think it's wild to look at the box office of the flash and go oh people have superhero movie fatigue that'd be like looking at like a company like twitter right now 
and going. And people just aren't that into social networking. And that's why this site isn't working. That's why people are leaving it because they just don't like social networking. Yeah, no, they still like that thing because there are other social networks that are doing quite well. There's a lot of specific things about this one that are unappealing and people are responding to. So I, I, I just like what I said in the beginning of this year was what we would need to see is a highly reviewed superhero movie bomb. And you look at that and you say, well, that bombed because it's a superhero movie. People just aren't psyched about that. Like, I think we've kind of, again, maybe this is like capitalism rotting our brains, believe this has to grow forever. Like Guardians 1 has to make a lot of money. Guardians 2 makes more money than that. Guardians 3 makes more money than that. Guardians 4 makes more money than that forever until it's making infinite money. And I just don't think, A, I don't think that's sustainable, but B, I don't think that means that if your movie makes a teeny bit less than Guardians 2, that's like fatigue or, or uh, failure. I mean, like maybe it's growth fatigue, but it's not like people aren't coming out and seeing this movie. And then you've got the other one in this list, Across the Spider-Verse, happens to be the highest reviewed movie on this list, tied with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. So out of the 17 highest grossing movies this year, it is the highest uh, reviewed, tied for highest reviewed Rotten Tomatoes movie. And it made internationally like worldwide 660 million dollars on a hundred million dollar budget and again we'll you know we'll see how much that's true and advertising and stuff but you know what spider-verse had ant-man toys you could buy toys the day the movie came out i have the spider punk and spider gwen action figures and i've thought about getting other ones honestly i kind of wish they'd make you know the ben riley action figure but yeah so that movie huge reviews lower budget than some of these other ones comparable opening weekend and worldwide domestic all that like it made a lot of money so again the two high reviewed superhero movies of this year made a lot of money are in the top five highest grossing movies of this year and the ones that were poorly reviewed made less money that is true of all of these like there's certain franchises that will always do well fast x third highest grossing movie of the year one of the worst reviewed on this list and you'll never believe the budget. I don't know if it has panned over it, so you've maybe seen it. It is the most expensive movie this year, as far as what's reported, of $340 million, which is like, good God. And I, you know, I could see where it came, showed up, because like that's, these guys are huge stars. And, you know, I imagine these movies make a lot of money internationally. I don't know, merchandise wise, if you could sell Dominic Toretto action figures, like how, how does that add up? But, you know i'm sure there's some i'm sure there's ways that they like remake their money but yeah you got other movies in here like john wick hundred million dollar budget making four hundred thousand or four hundred million dollars you know you got stuff like transformers 200 million budget 240 or 420 million so like you've some that that failed in in that way but kind of maybe broke even right transformers and transformers technically is probably still in theaters although i think it's probably not gonna make more money than this i guess what i'm saying is bob Iger, who i'm talking to now you have the second third sixth ninth and tenth highest grossing movies of this year right now you've also got marvels and probably some other stuff that's coming out that i've forgotten about wish i don't know about wish maybe that's gonna be a big hit and you're saying you get a scale back on the marvel where you get too many movies i just don't i just don't think that i think it can be managed better in terms of like toys come out at the same time the movie comes out that's a no-brainer and I understand scaling back on the TV shows because A, the quality has been all over the place and B, they're expensive. But unlike this, you know, right here, you can't immediately equate like the success. Oh, that made six hundred million dollars and it cost this much. Like it's so much harder to say how much money that actually made for Disney Plus. So I, I get not wanting to make a lot of those like looking at Secret Invasion and going like that. Maybe that wasn't a mistake. But like that is tricky. I understand that. And I think like Loki will come out later this year and probably be a big hit because Loki's the best one of these tied with. Well, I don't know. I think I think I like WandaVision the most. I really like She-Hulk. WandaVision, She-Hulk, Loki, top three. So it's it's one of the most popular ones starring what is debatably the most popular character that has one of these shows. And that's going to come out around the same time as the Marvels, which, you know, we'll see, but could be a big hit. So, like, we could be at the end of the year looking back at this and who knows what happens with Echo. But, like, looking at this slate going, oh, wow, like, Marvel was pretty good this year. They started with one not even bomb because it still made some money, but, like, not great movie that didn't they hit all the numbers they'd probably hoped. 
And then it, they had a show that wasn't a humongous success so far. There's two episodes left. Who knows? Maybe we'll pull it all together. But like, what does success look like to Disney at this point? If it's not the second highest grossing movie of the year, making almost a billion dollars. Like, do all of these movies need to make a billion dollars to even count or to register? And then this is my other problem. So looking at all of these numbers, looking at all of the box offices, um, the Rotten Tomato score and the budgets all together. It's like, man, if you just get these budgets down, these do not all need to be 200 million, 300 million dollar movies. Like Indiana Jones one, I'm sure didn't cost 300 million dollars to make. And I'm not saying that means that Indiana Jones five isn't going to cost more money. But I guess I am saying like, yeah, these movies are all kind of boom or bust because you were spending so much money on them that if you're not getting this unlimited growth where by the end of this, they're all making a billion dollars, then that's going to be a failure. But like, look at look at Spider-Verse. Look at John Wick. Look at Creed. Creed cost one hundred nineteen million dollars to make made two hundred seventy five million. That's a big success. That's very good. That was the, like those are good numbers. Like, there's a lot of movies on this list. Scream, $60 million to make $168 million worldwide. Obviously not the same kind of movie, but like, you know, Spider-Verse has a reported budget of $100 million. We'll see uh, if that's if that's accurate. But like, it can be done. Ant-Man 3 did not need to cost $200 million. It's like, looking at Quantumania now, obviously there's stuff that's not needed in that movie, but also just like, you put together three hours of movie to, you know, two and a half hours for quantum but like almost three hours for black Panther. And these movies don't need to be that long and they can be much cheaper. And when you do reshoot it, and if you're spending $10 million, that's not terrible. If you have to spend $50 million, that's pretty bad. Like that's a lot of extra money. Indiana Jones also way too long. The same thing with quantum We don't need, the guys, the, the Micronaut stand-in characters, we don't need Quaz. I mean, listen, for a lot of reasons, we don't need Quaz. But, like, Quaz, you know, Jen Thora, all those guys. Like, that whole thing. We didn't need Bill Murray in this movie. And I'm not saying we don't need them, like, so we shouldn't have anything fancy in this movie. But a longer movie with more CGI is more expensive to make. And it doesn't equate to better quality. It doesn't, you don't pay for the ticket based on the length of the movie. You pay one ticket price and you get to play it more times in the theater if it's shorter. So I don't understand why the incentive is to not just make an hour and a half, two hour long Ant-Man movie and then immediately save money on the budget. Smaller, short, like shorter movies I think could be huge hits. And could make so much money for Disney. And maybe it is behind the scenes. They just cannot manage this. Like Kevin Feige is like Will Smith going on three dates at the same movie theater with three different women in three different movies. Like it's just he, he he's losing his mind. And clearly the CGI resources are eaten up. But again, these are superheroes. They don't all have to fly. You can make a Daredevil movie. You can make like lots of movies for some of these characters where CGI is not the highest priority. Like, obviously, they're going to use CGI for parts of it that you wouldn't expect. Like, it's not just if your character flies at CGI and if they walk down the street, that all has to be practical. But, like, it seems like the thought process for a lot of these is like, well, for making Black Widow and it's a movie, it's got to have a lot of CGI stuff in it. It's got to be this big explosive thing because that's what people expect from a movie. And I do think it is that kind of, you know, tail wagging the dog or like, we expect going to a movie to be a big, expensive, CGI-filled experience. And because of that, no matter who's in the movie, that's going to be in the movie. And that seems like a mistake. Where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. So, superhero fatigue doesn't exist. I think it's smart to move away from Disney Plus shows. But also, it's something people expect now. They just want good ones. So I don't know how you how you make that transition and don't lose a lot of people from Disney Plus. But at the same time, like scaling back on the movies does not seem like the right or at least it doesn't seem like that is the problem. They're not releasing too many movies this year. And I don't think they released too many movies in 20 like 2021 because they were using that as an example. Like they released four movies in 2021. Yeah, Black Widow did fine. Not a humongous hit, but not a bomb by any measure. Shang-Chi, great franchise starting star like shang um simu liu is shang chi is a huge star now and 
you know, when they make a Shang-Chi 2, that, you know, that movie's going to make some money. And that movie was good. It played for a while. People were excited about it. They were talking about it. Eternals, big swing. Really respect him. That didn't do super well. And then Spider-Man, humongous movie, probably, I don't honestly don't remember, but one of the highest grossing movies of that year. So, like, again, it's like, what does success look like? I think we as an audience, this is what we need to do, is get more comfortable with consuming media like this, these comic book movies, consuming it like comic books are consumed. Where, you know, nobody goes in a theater and says, give me one of all the Marvel books. Someone probably does. But most people go in, they go, yeah, give me that X-Men book that I'm reading. Uh, let's see that new one, that that new Captain America book looks fun. Let's get She-Hulk because those books are great. And then if you hear something else is great, you pick that up after it's done once you know that it's good. But like this expectation that everybody has to see every movie and every movie has to make a billion dollars is unsustainable a like money wise it's not gonna work and i don't think it'll burn the audiences out but like that's not what any of us are doing anyway you talk to anybody about this and they're like i'm not as invested in the mcu as i was when it was one movie a year and it's like yeah so then just pick your one movie that you're gonna see this year and then see it and that's fine and like as long as these movies are not all supposed to be the highest grossing movie of all time that is a sustainable formula for marvel like, I'm not, okay, and I'm not, like, a box office analyst. I'm not one of those, like, a numbers guy. But I read about this stuff. I follow this stuff pretty closely. And, yeah, I'm sure, you know, all these suggestions I'm making to buy a buyer are stupid. But on the other hand, I think a lot of them are pretty common sense. Like, if I were in charge, this would be the challenge. I'd be like, Bob Iger, make a $100 million Thunderbolts movie. Scale the team down a little bit, maybe. Probably don't need all the characters you had. And, obviously, we're rewriting that now. And figure out a way to make that movie for 100, maybe even 150 million dollars. Go nuts, but like not 250 million dollars because they're not all Avengers. This is not every movie doesn't have to be Avengers. And also put this stuff out because like again, again we we make fun of The Rock because it was very funny. But like Shang Chi comes out and makes a lot of money as a movie, but also sells a lot of toys, a lot of Halloween costumes. Kids go out to Disney World and expect to see Shang-Chi. They're excited about Shang-Chi and maybe some sort of martial arts show at Disney World. I don't know what Disney World's doing, but like I know Doctor Strange does magic, which like, I'm sorry, can you not get Ant-Man or Jimmy Woo to do magic? Because Doctor Strange doesn't do, he's not a conjurer of cheap tricks. He is a magician, like he does magic magic. So then why why is Ant-Man not doing the close? I don't know, that's, that's just a little pet peeve of mine. But yeah, like, I think what we've what we've adjusted to, because I'll admit, I don't go to see every movie in theaters immediately like I used to. That is not how I play this now. I see a movie that looks fun. Then I'm like, that looks like it'll be a good time. Like, for instance, I saw a movie recently uh, that just came on VOD called The Blackening. It's a comedy. I describe it as right in the middle between scary movie movies from like the 2000s and Get Out. Right. It's more socially conscious than scary movie, but at the same time, it's quite silly. And I think it's great. I had a really, really, really good time with it. That movie, I'm probably not going to go see in a movie theater just because I don't go to movie theaters that as often as I used to because tickets are expensive and COVID still exists. And sometimes the movie theater experience is very bad. So I, I think we as an audience have to start expecting that the big Marvel movie like ant-man or even guardians of the galaxy is not going to get the same box office because no movies are like i guess some movies clearly are it's like you know super mario brothers made a bazillion dollars but like people engage with movies differently i don't i like i do i i'm somewhat sympathetic to the position of the ceo of disney right now as someone who has to figure out what to do with disney plus because you can't be like have some extra five dollars to watch you know, Ant-Man at home two weeks after it's in theaters because then you'll lose money in theaters. Like, I do think they can see that. That That is a number that they have because they tried this with Black Widow. So, like, they know that doesn't work. I don't know. But superhero fatigue is not a thing and keep making the movies. I don't think you could do six Marvel movies a year unless Werewolf by Night. Like, that's the thing. Werewolf by Night could have been a theatrical movie if it was a little longer and it was marketed like one. That could be a huge hit. How much did that cost to make? Let's let's look it up. 
Like that should be the secret sauce here. But instead, it seems like they don't want to do that ever again because that thing that they didn't advertise as shockingly actually wasn't a humongous success. But like, it was good. I liked it a lot. There's no domestic box office information for it. I can't find any budget info either. Yeah, not surprised. But yeah, it was 52 minutes. Easily could have been theatrical and could have made money. Like, could have made a lot of money because it was good. It's That part is frustrating, too, because, like, as someone who likes these characters, clearly, because one of my videos that's going to be coming out soon is a pitch for Midnight Sun's movie. Like, if we scale back, we're not going to get that until, like, five years from now when some of the actors don't want to do it anymore and some just kind of aren't in that space and people have kind of forgotten about that. Like, so I think there's... I think the part of the problem is taking your foot off the gas on a cinematic universe like this is also kind of admitting defeat, and I don't... I don't see how you continue. But like out of everybody, out of Marvel, Lucasfilm, Disney Animation, I Marvel does not look like the problem child here. People on the internet like to pretend it is, but I feel like if Little Mermaid was making the money, if Little Mermaid and Guardians were switched on the scales, like on the chart, I'd be like, yeah, Marvel needs to figure that out. But they're not, so I don't know. So the in, in conclusion, Marvel, figure out how to make a $100 million movie. Uh, pay your writers, pay your actors, pay everybody uh, that deserves to be paid. Because, yeah, I love these movies. I really do. In the stupidest way. Like, in the in the way that, like, a fan. I have the action figures and stuff. It's a big part of my, like, identity. You can't walk into my apartment and not kind of get that sense immediately. But I want them to work. And, like, the same way that people like the Jets and you watch the Jets lose a game and it's just frustrating because you're like you guys can win you, I want you to win I want Marvel to win you know maybe that means a rebuilding year we have to rebuild to something we have to get somewhere and right now besides scaling back I don't see what the end game is and that's, that's a upsetting so anyway thank you for indulging me on this way too long video uh, everybody that's watching this you're fantastic I'll see you on the discord I'll see you on Twitter everything like that Look out for my videos. Look out for all my podcasts, mostly nitpicking stuff like that. And thank you all so much. Stay safe. Uh, and we support the striking writers and actors.